said in the beginning, we, we stand with the Larson family since day one. We'll stand beside them, behind them, and wherever else they want us to stand until we find Ryan. Ryan's mother, Tammy, asked Wedekin to read her remarks. She shared how Ryan loves to be inventive and has aspirations to go into a number of public service fields. Ryan has big dreams, so we need to find him to bring him home so he can accomplish every one of them. About two and a half months ago, then 11-year-old Ryan Larson went missing from school he hasn't been seen since. And in that video clip you saw earlier, that was actually a neighbor that has been extremely helpful in this case. Uh, he's actually even been leaving water and drinks out with notes for Ryan, um, telling him it's okay to come home if he's ready to come home. The family is really almost too hurt to talk about what's going on around this and somewhat fearful of potential social media backlash. And, you know, if you look at cases recently of children that go missing, for example, the Summer Wells case, um, I, I think they have a lot to be concerned about in terms of, of trying to speak to the public about what's going on in this case. That being said, Ryan's sister has come forward with a little bit of information. We're going to share that with you as well. But there's a really big consideration in all this. Ryan is on the autism spectrum. We've got big concerns, a big investigation that has happened so far. Unfortunately, the media is starting to kind of taper off on this case a little bit. So I think it's time that we turn on the searchlight for Ryan Larson. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. Let's get right into the details. We have a lot to cover on today's episode. This is a poster for Ryan Larson over at missingkids.org. Of course, that's the website run by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And we're coming here for the basic details because as of right now, I don't see a name as profile for Ryan. Uh, of course, myself, my team, we're going to look into that and make sure a name as profile does come together for Ryan, especially with how far out we are now from his disappearance. I think it's really important that he gets into that system. But let's get the basics here. Missing since May 17th, 2021 from La Vista, Nebraska. His date of birth is June 8th, 2009. So obviously he did have a birthday recently. He is now 12 years old. White male with brown hair, hazel eyes, stands at five feet, eight inches tall, weighs about 125 pounds. We've got a few photos of him here. Uh, no real circumstances of his disappearance. We're going to get to that in just a little bit. La Vista is a city in Sarpy County, Nebraska, United States. The population was 15,758 at the 2010 census. It's a suburb of Omaha, bordered by the cities of Omaha and Ralston on the north, Papillon on the south, Bellevue on the east, and Interstate 80 to the west. It is also Sarpy County's third largest city. Next, we're coming to a tweet put out by the Nebraska State Patrol. We're going to get a little more detail here. We really didn't have a good clothing description in the uh, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, but we've got one here. This tweet came out as part of an endangered missing advisory. Um, with a case like this, essentially Ryan goes he, he kind of leaves school. It seems like he's acting of his own accord, decides that he's just going to leave in the middle of the day from school. So uh, for an Amber Alert, they don't quite have the right conditions going on for an Amber Alert. There's very specific things they need for that. In most states, it is, uh, it's sometimes as strict as they need at least a make model of the vehicle. They need to know the child is in imminent danger, is with someone that could possibly harm them. We don't have a lot of those conditions at play here. They do wind up issuing an endangered missing advisory. Uh, a endangered missing advisory has been issued for Eastern Nebraska. The La Vista Police Department is attempting to locate Ryan Larson, once again, 11 years old, white male, 5 feet 8 inches tall, 125 pounds, brown hair, hazel eyes, and wearing a black jacket, blue jeans, Old Navy t-shirt, and a polka-dotted umbrella. He's, he's carrying an umbrella as well. 
Uh, Larson is on the autistic spectrum and was last known to be in the vicinity of 78th Street and Terry Drive in La Vista at approximately noon. And they have contact information. Of course, we've got it on the screen here already. It's also in the description box down below if you have any information on this case. Let's take a look at a map real quick to figure this out. Um, the gist of the story is he's at school um, and considering the location they're talking about, it looks like it's likely La Vista West Elementary School. And they're changing classrooms in the middle of the day. I don't know if they run it with kind of having different periods where you go to different classes or if there was some type of function or event that happened where uh, effectively he was changing classrooms at that time. But that's the last time anyone saw him. And then it seems like he just kind of left. He left school. Uh, this walking trail that I have highlighted here is to his home. His home is at the Southfield Apartments, and that is about a half mile away from his school. Over at WFLA, we get another kind of big cause for concern. Missing 11-year-old Nebraska boy with autism searched how to hide from police. And there's something else I kind of want to show you. Um, he seems to, I don't know if he likes to play that he's acting like a police officer. There is a picture of him here where you can see he's he's got a mask on. Uh, he's wearing a little police badge around his neck. You can't really see it in this picture so much. You can see it better in other ones, but he's got like a little Nerf gun or, or some kind of toy blaster. He's got a little compass attached to him. And here to me, it kind of seems like he's emulating wanting to be a police officer. And kind of with some of the comments I've seen from his family, they're talking about him wanting to get into some type of community service. Um, so I'm kind of curious about that search term. Why would he be searching on how to hide from police? Uh, I'm almost wondering, was he searching on that kind of in a reverse way? Like, you know, sometimes in the work I do, I do interesting searches like that because I'm kind of looking for information that criminals might be considering. How do, how would they hide from police? Cause if you have that information, maybe you could figure out the mechanisms they're using to hide. And then that might lead you to some type of conclusion or, or better information. Um, so let's continue here. This is an article from May 20th, 2021. La Vista police say 11 year old Ryan Larson walked out of his elementary school Monday morning and hasn't been seen since. Police say the child has a history of hiding from his family and has a habit of hiding in small spaces really troubling information uh, when we're talking about a missing persons case that's been going on this long. But officials say he's never been missing for days at a time. Police say a search of the family's computer showed Ryan had conducted online searches using the phrases hiding from the police, hiding underground, and how to avoid being spotted. Uh, and from what I understand from some other articles, I think he was actually searching on those terms here on YouTube. Uh, let's continue over at Crime Online with some more details. 11-year-old Ryan Larson was last seen around midday Monday at school in La Vista, Nebraska. He's believed to have slipped out during a classroom change. Investigators appear to be considering additional possibilities after previously saying they believed Larson was intentionally hiding. And that's something that you're going to see as kind of a trend as we're going through this information today. There's a very strong belief right off the bat that, oh, you know, he, he's essentially a runaway of some type. He's looked up this information and he's trying to hide from police. Um, as time goes on, as search efforts happen and those doors kind of get closed, we're going to see that the police, they, they change their, their thinking a little bit in terms of, of possible scenarios that are going on here. And quite honestly, by the time we get to the end of today's episode, I think um, you're going to see that the, they're worried that there's some component that we haven't accounted for him, possibly uh, some type of foul play element or something that could have happened to him after he ran off and, and went on this adventure. Um, La Vista police captain Jeremy Kinsey said at a news conference that Larson was very high functioning and has a history of hiding and running away. Quote, he's playing the ultimate game of hide and seek on us now, and he's winning. John Francovilla from the La Vista Police Department said Thursday morning, the investigators are not ruling out various possibilities for the boy's disappearance. We have to look at it. Is this a criminal matter? Is he playing hide and seek? Is this a little boy who got in trouble and unfortunately has passed due to that? We're looking at all angles. Our concentration is finding Ryan and bringing him home to his family. Frank Avila continued, with autism from some of the stuff we've been getting from the experts, 
while the normal person, we need food, we need water, we need sleep, to him, he's mission-driven. So he will supersede all those needs and continue on with his mission to where it, where it would affect us. It's not affecting him the way that it would us. That's a really interesting consideration and something I wasn't aware of before I looked into this case. Uh, and also scary because if he pushes himself past those points, isn't taking care of himself with nourishment, particularly you know in these first days, uh, worrying about water. But as long as this has been going on, absolutely food, um, could that put him in a dangerous spot as well? Uh, it's day four in the search for missing 11-year-old Ryan Larson. Police, FBI agents, and hundreds of community members have pitched in to help bring him home. As we frequently see with missing children cases, this community rushes to action. Uh, the police department, they throw a ton of resources into this. They start reaching out to other departments, calling in for help. But I want to always, as I'm going through these cases, I want to highlight uh, the communities and the strong things that are happening around there. And Omaha area business is doing its part by dedicating its digital billboard to the search. Quote, at our staff meeting this morning, we all agreed we should use our digital billboard solely for this purpose, said ServPro of Omaha Southwest Operations Manager Brian Johnson. And here are some of the graphics that they had made up to show up on that billboard. Um, and I think it's really cool that they're doing that and dedicating that billboard to basically posting this message. I know on some of those digital billboards, they can kind of flicker through several different ads. Um, you know, you never know when that one person's driving by, and if that billboard happens to not be on the right image, they could potentially miss it. But uh, I think that's really good of ServPro to step up and do that. Also here at KETV, some neighbors are doing their part to hopefully encourage Ryan to go home. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Uh, he was in the clip we started this video with. At the end of his driveway, Ryan Wendekin makes a plea to the missing sixth grader. Quote, letting him know that the water's for him, he's not in any trouble, he's missed, he's loved, it's okay to go home, Wendekin said. Along with the note, Wendekin and his fiance left water bottles, Gatorade, and soda out for Ryan. They're hoping for his safe return. At the school, Director of Communications Annette Iman said that they've had counselors available for staff, teachers, and students since Tuesday. Um, that's another thing. I don't know if many of you experience this, but whenever there is a big tragedy um, to one particular student at a school, uh, it really ripples across the school community as well. It can affect other students. Uh, obviously, they're also looking out for the staff and the teachers here. But in this case, we also have the autistic community that is being affected by this. I've seen comments from families saying, you know, this is our worst nightmare. This absolutely could have been us. But they're also noting it's affecting their children that are on the spectrum as well. Um, there's just a lot of fears about what could have happened to Ryan that are bubbling up for, for everyone. Uh, as a matter of fact, here's a quote from Iman. It's everyone's worst nightmare. It's a parent's worst nightmare. It's a teacher. It's a staff's worst nightmare. We're all just trying to be optimistic and hope for his quick return, Iman said. Uh, and honestly, I've been hoping for that too. I've been tracking this case for a couple of weeks and just was really hoping, okay, we're going to see this turn around. We're going to see him pop back up. Um, unfortunately, we're here and we're, we're making an episode. Federal agencies now involved in search for missing La Vista Boy. So you can see very, very quickly, May 20th, we've already got federal resources being pulled for this as well. Police put together another search party at the creek near Brookhaven Park. Um, if we take a look back at the map real quick, you'll see that kind of near where he would have been walking around, um, for water sources, we've got a little bit of a creek here, a little bit of a creek up here, another creek down here, um, a couple water sources. I think this is, yeah, this is a golf course here. Um, so it seems like they've got a big concern about that. We're going to learn a little bit more why later. And Walnut Creek Recreation Park looks like it has a pretty considerable water source as well. And that kind of becomes a focal point, uh, not the water source necessarily, but that area for the investigation, which we'll learn more about. Police also went door to door at Larson's apartment complex. Canines are being utilized. Officers also searched Walnut Creek Recreation Area for a second time in hopes that a smaller group might be less intimidating for Larson if he was hiding there. 
that's another thing. Um, the family was very clear very early on that this is a young man that could be scared off pretty easy, probably doesn't want to interact with strangers. As a matter of fact, the police department was putting out the information that if you come across him, don't approach him. Uh, keep him in sight, call 911, get some law enforcement there immediately. So we've got a tricky aspect in terms of this investigation right from the start, outside of the fact that it seems like he's motivated to be hiding from people. Um, but on top of that, just in terms of general social interaction, he's probably going to shy away from strangers, uh, which once again points out why that neighbor's idea of putting notes out and leaving, you know, Gatorade and water for him might be a good approach. I'm, I'm really glad people are thinking along those lines. The Sarpy County Search and Rescue Team utilized boats to search the ponds near the La Vista Central Park. Drive around La Vista and you'll see people out walking and taking an extra peek in shrubs and bushes. Now, federal agencies are helping with the search, including the FBI and, of course, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Some of those things that we provide are search and rescue management, technical support, investigative recommendations and strategies, equipment resources, and then there's a team that also helps families in these situations, says Jonathan Larson, no relation, uh, with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And that's part of the reason why we make a donation to them every single month. Uh, Nick Mick is just in the right place, taking the right actions, trying to help in these tough situations. Leslie Bishop Hartung with the Autism Center of Nebraska says it's important to remember every person who is on the autism spectrum is different. Quote, when we work with people that particular end of the spectrum, what we typically will see are people are maybe very concrete thinkers who maybe would not recognize a verbal idiom very quickly and might take it literally, said Bishop. She also says the best thing the public can do is support the family and be empathetic. And that's a really important one that I just want to highlight for this case in particular. I think from what I can see in these articles, there's some type of social media push or backlash going on towards the family because we're not seeing video clips of the mother speaking about her missing son, you know, crying for the cameras, doing all that kind of stuff, which admittedly, when I'm speaking to families that are needing help in these cases, I talk to them about how easy it is to get the press out using that type of communication. If you can get a family member that's extremely passionate to talk about the missing person, it should be relatively easy to get local cameras on that person. For this case in particular, I can tell you the media erupted around it without that. So at that point, the main one of the main reasons I would see for doing that is really out of play in this case. And I'm kind of disappointed to know that some people are looking at that, at that and trying to think, oh my God, is there something that happened in the family home or, or could you know somehow the family be responsible in some way? This is a missing persons case. There's professionals, investigators working on it. They're going to go through all those considerations. Uh, I'll tell you now, just based off the information that I've seen that they've released publicly, doesn't seem like there's a very strong possibility of that. Essentially, the time he leaves school, um, no one's at home. So, I mean, yes, could you theorize something happened later in the day or something along those lines? Sure, ab absolutely. Um, but I also have spoken to enough families in tough situations to know that people handle things very, very differently from one person to the next. And there are a multitude of reasons why um, you might not get the mother of the missing kid to, to come and speak in front of a camera. Um, so it's, it's one of those things. I just kind of want to keep that in mind as we're going through the information here today, because what I'm seeing is law enforcement kind of putting out a very strong message. Hey, we're hearing some silly stuff on the internet and basically support this family, knock it off. We're, we're trying to help find this, this missing kid here. Um, and here's kind of a quote. People sometimes have an idea that parents should have done this or shouldn't have done that. But the reality is the parents are doing everything they possibly can every day that they have a child with special needs. It's an adventure every day, she says. 
So we're already, we have an autism expert already telling us that is like a regular factor in terms of what you're going to see with a family that has this dynamic. But on top of that, we've got a missing persons investigation layered on top of that, that has kind of doubled up this dynamic as well. So, um, Police are asking everyone in the La Vista and surrounding areas to check small places around their homes, like in sheds, under decks, and in garages. They also ask people to check their ring doorbells for any sightings. It struck me when I read that um, we don't hear that call made very often publicly like this. And it's such a good thing. I, I hope that more uh, police spokesmen and uh, people that are in the media space like this will remind the public about that. How many of us have doorbell cameras at this point? And with the information that we have about a case like this, we know the area. We know about the time he disappeared. We know the neighborhood. It's really easy to focus in on that and say, okay, you're, you are the people that we're talking to. Check those ring doorbells. But on top of that, now we've got an open-ended time frame. We don't know how far he could have gotten. Um, I think it's really important to put that message out through media, and I was really happy to see this. I'm telling you guys, I'm certainly going to remember it for coverage in the future as well. Over at fox42kptm.com, day five, and kind of an interesting change. LVPD is now asking volunteer searches searchers to stay home. The search for a missing 11-year-old boy with autism went into its fifth day Friday with the La Vista Police Department asking volunteers to stay home. And they have an actual tweet here from them. With more than 200 officers and support staff searching, we do not need volunteer searchers at this time. I think it's because of the special considerations that we're talking about uh, with Ryan's personality here in terms of him maybe not wanting to interact with strangers. So I think they're getting worried that maybe if we have too many people out there, we might be scaring him off. Um, instead, officers ask people to consider donating to organizations helping in the search. They specifically call out the Salvation Army and, of course, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So I talked earlier about how that park in particular seems to be a place of interest. We actually have the police block off access for the public there as they do some of their search. La Vista Police Chief Bob Lawson told KETV that the Walnut Creek Recreation Area is one of the best leads they have in the search for Larson. We know there have been cases, our FBI partners have told us, they've had missing kids with autism that have been out for seven days and they've been found alive and everything has been okay, he said. Police have said that Larson is high functioning and does not want to be approached by strangers. Earlier this week, authorities advised members of the community to avoid engaging the boy if they saw him, but to keep an eye on him and call police. Why are they focusing this area in particular? Uh, I've listened to most of the reports that the police chief has done, um, and I want to also point that out in terms of communication. In a lot of cases, we don't have the police being very open with the public, and that can lead to families needing to make that communication to get the media kind of spinning on the story and get some of those stories written and created. Here, we have a police chief that is doing extremely regular updates, lengthy updates, answering questions from the press regularly. Um, so once again, the needs for that family dynamic with this case in particular um, aren't they're not necessarily there. There's a lot of those needs being met by people that are being helpful to this situation, and the police chief is absolutely one of them. Uh, that being said, in one of those interviews, I do recall him talking about the fact that uh, I believe Ryan has been to that recreation area before. It's probably a place that uh, it's possible his family could have said that you know he really likes that area, or maybe even in one of his previous times that he's wandered off, maybe he's wound up going in that direction or made some mention of wanting to go there. Um, all right, over at KETV.com, Matt Sutter with Nebraska State Patrol warned that the endangered missing advisory for Larson will be expiring soon, but that's only because these must expire after 72 hours. And they were concerned about this because initially they were going to put out this message, and I guess it works a little bit like an Amber Alert. You get a, you know, your cell phone gets a, a special message if you're in the right area. And they were worried about putting out the message that it's being canceled would all of a sudden send the wrong message to the public, that everyone would think, oh, he's been found. 
And some people might even think, uh-oh, he's been found. Is he still alive or is he not alive? Is there arrest? an arrest coming soon? So they knew that they were hitting this point of the expiration coming up. And they're like, we got to get a message out to the public and let them know this doesn't change anything. So that's effectively part of what this article is doing. Uh, he goes to further explain it here. The EMA expires due to preset guidelines. It does not indicate any update in this case. And in all caps, we are still searching for Ryan, La Vista police wrote. The Nebraska State Patrol issued it to reach as many people as quickly as possible. We have support from several dive rescue teams from UTAN, Omaha, Council Bluffs, and Des Moines to use the best tools available to help us search for Ryan. Those cancellations go out all the time when someone is either located and also when they're not located. Police Chief Bob Lawson said that the authorities are focusing their search for Ryan in multiple areas, but they are noting Walnut Creek, where Ryan's family had visited before. Quote, we're 96 hours into this, and I'm really worried, he said. Nebraska State Patrol on Friday was blocking off entrances to Walnut Creek Recreation Area, and area authorities have continually zeroed in on during the search for the missing boy who has autism. Search teams were also deployed on waterways at the recreational area and near La Vista Central Park on Thursday. Autism experts have shared that children with autism gravitate toward water, the release stated. So I think that's why uh, another part of the factor, yes, the family has visited there before, but if we just zoom out here and we look for significant water sources, sure, we got the Missouri River that's kind of off here, but add the information that Ryan has been there before, this is a pretty substantial water source in this Walnut Creek Recreation Area. I understand it's also a really tough search. Um, there's some parts of this that are just muck, um, and even in the water, there's a lot of debris and mud, a uh, very difficult search effort that's going on around that. Um, outside of that, it looks like there's another substantial water source over here, but I think they're just paralleling that information with, you know, his family's telling us that they've been there before. As a matter of fact, those search efforts are so tough, they take it a step further. Water levels are being lowered at Walnut Creek to help the search. By lowering the water levels a few feet, search teams can better access the water. Multiple agencies have assisted with the search for Ryan, offering dive teams, expertise, high-tech equipment, air support, and specially trained canine units, said another release. Over at KETV, Police Chief Bob Lawson said Monday night he was aware of rumors swirling on social media about an arrest. He said that these are false and disgusting. There's been some chatter on social media from some keyboard warriors in basements talking about, we have an arrest, we found Ryan. That is absolutely false. Any information that's going to come about this case is going to come from the La Vista Police Department, he said. We continue to search. Uh, in one of the interviews, he even went as far as saying, you're not going to see a tweet that says we found Ryan. You're gonna see a message, we're holding a press conference, and then you're gonna have me speaking at this press conference explaining all the details of what's going on leading to us finding him. Um, so he's been very, very clear about the communication around this case. Uh, Lawson said that the area they focused on, the northeast end of Walnut Creek Lake, is where the canines have indicated. Yeah, so we have cadaver canines essentially hitting in the northeast end of Walnut Creek Lake. He said multiple scent dogs have indicated in the same area. He said there have been sonar hits, but so far those have turned out to be tires and tree branches. Uh, Lawson was asked if there's any reason to believe there is foul play involved. Quote, until we find Ryan, we can't get to the point to figure that out, he said. I look into a lot of these cases and I gotta say, uh, this police chief, the way he's handling communication, the approach that I see, how fast they sprung into action, the steps that they're taking, I personally feel like they're doing a very, very good job in this case. Uh, and I know it's tough. We're talking two and a half months later, family waiting desperately for answers, community waiting for answers. There's probably a lot of very strong feelings out there, maybe some statements about them not doing their job properly, that kind of stuff. I got to tell you, for the steps I'm seeing here, this is a very solid effort to locate Ryan. 
Search dogs signaled three times for missing boy near Walnut Creek. La Vista police closed Walnut Creek to the public before the weekend to be able to search. And just to be clear, this is around the end of May, May 24th. It opened back up over the weekend, but dive teams and search dogs are still in the area Monday. Uh, police chief Bob Lawson said multiple search dogs have signaled Ryan sent around a specific area. Now that's a little different. Uh, some of the later ones I'm seeing, I I thought it was actually cadaver dogs that were signaling there. And we're going to see by some later comments, he I think he does believe that there might be some remains there um, that they haven't been able to locate yet just because of the type of area that it is. It's just muck. He, he described it as like just a pile. It's just a pile of stuff trying to, to figure out where it is. But they've had dogs go out there multiple times, three separate dogs signaling in the same area. Um, I think this might just be a little, you know, the press is kind of early on this. They're saying it's Ryan sent in that area. I'm not hundred percent sure on that. Uh, they had three hits one Friday, again, on Sunday, one more on Monday, around 35 different organizations are involved in the search, including FEMA and FBI agents from around the Midwest. Officers are asking people who are familiar with the trails in the area to keep an eye out while they're out there walking. We already talked about this affecting the community. Um, this also sometimes brings good ideas to the forefront and sometimes helps escalate those. I don't know if this is just a matter of timing or what, but Omaha police started offering what they call the big red safety box for families that might have wanderers. Uh, and we can see right on this big red safety box, uh, it's sponsored by the National Autism Association. They've also got local sponsors because this box uh, there's some good materials in it for families that might be facing this. As several agencies continue to search for 11-year-old Ryan Larson, Omaha police have put together safety boxes filled with resources for families that could have a wanderer. The boxes contain a caregiver checklist, a specially formatted family emergency plan, a first responder profile form, a wandering prevention brochure, a sample IEP letter, a student profile form, emotion identification cards, wandering quick tips. But outside of that, um, I mean, already a ton of information, a great resource just in that. Two GE wireless door window alarms with batteries, one medic alert bracelet or pendant, and one shoe ID tag, five adhesive stop signs for doors and windows, two safety alert window clings for car or home windows, one red safety alert wristband, one child ID kit from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, if you are in a family that has a wanderer, I would say look into your local resources, see if you can get a hold of something like this. Even if you can't, look at this article, the link's down below, and I just went through it item by item. You need this type of kit. I love this idea of sending window or door alarms to these families and letting them just set those up Make sure you got batteries that are active in it and you'll know what's going on. We're also going to hear about an even more high-tech solution for this as we go forward. And it's a high-tech solution that kind of should have applied to Ryan, but something happened there. Uh, let's continue with another article on the details of the search. Authorities looking for a missing 11-year-old boy have suspended their search of Walnut Creek Recreation Area and instead will focus on the hours of surveillance video that they've been combing through. So we're seeing pretty big shift in the investigation. It looks like they, they put a lot of resources into the Walnut Creek area and now they're kind of pulling out of that. Uh, Police Chief Bob Lawson said the department has exhausted its leads at the sprawling recreation area, including the northeast end of the lake where multiple search dogs over several days made a hit. Despite surveillance video being commonplace at many homes and businesses, only one image of Ryan has surfaced so far. Really interesting key piece of information here. About an hour and a half after Ryan left school, an image believed to be him was captured by La Vista Kino, which is across the street from the apartments where he lived. Shortly thereafter, Lawson said an eyewitness said they saw Ryan right outside his apartment. 
in his apartment complex, basically the same apartment complex Ryan lives in. Uh, let's take a look at where this is going on. So earlier I showed you their initial search area close to his school, 78th Street and Terry Drive, his apartments, Southfield apartments in this area. Uh, La Vista Kino and Sports Bar is right here. And I heard a description from the police chief. He was saying that the video, they're pretty certain it's Ryan. Uh, the family agrees they think it's him. Law enforcement says they think it's him, but it's extremely pixelated. And here's why. It seems like there's a camera aimed in this direction. And the person we're assuming is Ryan is actually near the KFC. And there's some stuff he says that makes it sound like there might have been a police cruiser that actually drove by. This is when the search is actually going on for him. And it looks like he might have been ducking out of view of a, of a police cruiser that was driving around this area. So this KFC extremely close to his house, uh, having a sighting in this area makes a lot of sense. And what they're saying is we've got around 1.30, uh, we've got the sighting here. And then somewhere like 10 minutes after that, a neighbor of Ryan's that lives in the same apartment complex sees him somewhere in this complex. They're not telling us exactly where in the complex, but um, so it seems like he's in this area. And it's interesting to think of all the time and focus that they've put in in terms of the Walnut Creek search uh, and seeing that the actual direction that we have his trail picked up on, he's going a different direction. He's going essentially west and a little bit north. Does that change at some point? Maybe. Um, if his destination was to go down to Walnut Creek, I don't know why he would have come up here first necessarily. But um, some really interesting information in terms of those sightings. Police are having the La Vista Kino video enhanced to better ascertain that the image is Ryan. Uh, I believe that was sent to the FBI for enhancement. Over the weekend, La Vista police went door to door along 72nd, 84th, 96th, and Harrison Streets, obtaining and making copies of surveillance video. So definitely beefing up the search in terms of grabbing video. Uh, we also get a little more detail here in terms of his disappearance from the school. Uh, last seen at the elementary school, this is Annette Iman's information, uh, Ryan was missing less than five minutes before school employees realized he was gone. Quote, a staff member saw him in the hallway, talked with him. He was heading towards his classroom, and he never went to his classroom, Iman said. From the time that he was last seen in the hallway till the time that people started looking for him, it was less than five minutes. They looked in the building first to see if they could find him and then immediately contacted police and immediately contacted his mom, she said. So very, very quick action on the school's parts. Um, La Vista West is an older building with lots of exits, she said. We don't even know for certain which door he left. The district does not have security cameras at its elementary schools. By law, the doors must not lock in students because they have to be able to get out of the building in, in terms of an emergency that happens there. So some real tough conditions around this. I don't know why we don't have cameras at an elementary school, particularly if, you're, if you've got doors that can be accessed like that. I just kind of makes sense that there should be some cameras. This article goes on to say that uh, the, the staff members are getting pretty beat up over what's going on there. They're certainly trying to focus on helping the effort to find Ryan, and there's they're going to be looking at their protocols to see if they need to do things differently. Um, I just, I don't, cameras are so cheap nowadays. I just, I, I don't understand why we don't have them anywhere, uh, especially for something like a, a public school like that. We have Ryan's disappearance affect the community in another way. With Ryan still missing, La Vista scales back its Salute to Summer events. The city of La Vista is postponing some of its Salute to Summer plans. Friday's fireworks show and Saturday's express parade will not take place because of the law enforcement presence necessary to hold the events safely. And here's a quote from the mayor, Mayor Kindig. To be honest, those resources are focused elsewhere at this time. Uh, I'm sure you've got law enforcement just burning all kinds of overtime on this. And to think that they would pull dozens of law enforcement officers off so that they could, you know, be security at a fireworks show, at a parade, 
um, I think this is a really good call. And once again, just another sign of how you have the community doing everything they can to support this search effort. So earlier I mentioned maybe a more high-tech solution that should have applied to Ryan. Uh, let's listen in on this conference to see what I was talking about. I know a lot of kids have been found with Project Lifesaver, but from what I understand, it sounds like Ryan's was cut off at some point. Project, Project Lifesaver, the, um, the client is what they're called, will have a, a, a transmitter, some type of band. Uh, similar to um, you know, house arrest, they may have an ankle monitor. Those things get cut off. And some, some kids that are on Project Lifesaver, uh, for whatever behavioral reason or um, uh, neurological reason, uh, don't like to have, don't like to wear chains, watches, or anything like that. And so some kids will, will cut those off. Um, and and it, it's ineffective then once, once they're off. You know, we don't, have, we don't have a microchip on somebody that says, hey, you know, a GPS locator. Probably coming down the road, you know, I don't know. Um, so it's kind of where we're at. I hadn't heard about Project Lifesaver before, uh, so I looked into it a little more. And I know a lot of us, we'd hear something like that and think that it's like a GPS unit. It's tracking everywhere that they're going. That's not really how it works. It's actually a, I think it's a radio frequency emitter that's on a unique band. And they have to use these devices that are huge. Uh, I mean, huge in terms of an electronic device, like with these big antenna arrays on them. And essentially, they're able to key into that specific frequency and use this device to determine what direction they're in. And as they get closer and closer, I'm sure the device lets them know that they're they're getting closer. Uh, so not exactly the same as thinking of like a, you know, a GPS unit and his parents can log into it and see where he is. Nothing like that. This is something that's done specifically for law enforcement organizations that have been fortunate enough or smart enough to engage Project Lifesaver and actually have it implemented in their areas. And from what I can see on the information I've been able to find about it, it seems like Ryan had one. He did cut it off, but not around this disappearance. He cut it off a few months ago um, in February is what the information I'm seeing. I'm not seeing any good reason for, for why he cut it off. I mean, I think the chief speaks pretty well to the concerns of people that, that have it, um, there, but so that's a little bit about project lifesaver, but because of this, it's actually influenced a bunch of other families to look into this as well, because this was on the news over two dozen new families have signed up. Since 2008, the Sarpy County Sheriff's Office has had 60 people in its Project Lifesaver program, helping reunite countless families with loved ones. That's another thing. Over at the website for the, the national level of Project Lifesaver, they say they have a 100% success rate with this thing. That when they turn them on, as long as they're still wearing it, uh, they're able to find them 100% of the time. We have only had successful finds. We've never had one where we didn't find somebody. By May 26th, we already have a rally. Families, teachers, and community members are in Central Park tonight rallying for Ryan. You could feel the mixed emotions in the crowd, the sadness, the fear, but also the hope. Nearly 200 people attended. Katherine Kelly said the situation is personal. Her son is autistic and is known to elope. It could have been us. Absolutely, it could have been us, she explained. Kelly said it's important for the autism community to show their support because they understand this feeling more than most. It's horrifying. It's the worst fear that you could potentially have, and you don't get it unless you're in it, she said. Kelly added that people with autism can become easily disoriented and hopes the community will continue to search, saying it may not be a game of hide and seek anymore. La Vista Mayor Doug Kindig said the community and the city will not stop searching. Larson's mom did come to the rally, but did not speak. La Vista police kind of reinforced their statement. And I also just want to be clear, uh, in several of the interviews I saw, the police chief is very clear. The family is absolutely cooperating in every way with the investigation. But they put out another quote here. We ask all to continue to respect the privacy of Ryan's family and loved ones. We're updating them frequently on our search for Ryan, and they are understandably fearful and concerned. Please be understanding of their decision regarding public comments or lack thereof. The release states so very direct um, 
ask from the LVPD there. Here at 3newsnow.com is an actual quote. Ryan's family has been nothing but cooperative and law enforcement's in daily contact with them. But outside of that, we get another very important consideration. He said that some of the medication Ryan was taking would not be life-threatening if he missed a few doses, but that 10 days without it would cause health complications. Uh, I do believe it had to do with seizures, some of the medication. I don't know if that's all the medication, but I've seen some comments about that. The police appreciate tips from the public, but rumors and theories that are not grounded in fact are not helpful, said Lawson. He also said that they do not need additional search parties at this stage. The briefing ended with Lawson saying that sometimes these searches take time. He asked that people alert authorities if they see or smell something unusual. He also asked the public for support and prayers. It seems like there's finally a breaking point and we do have a family member. Ryan's sister comes forward to try to address some of the criticism that's going on directed towards her family. The sister of missing 11-year-old boy Ryan Larson took to social media to defend her family and tell the public that criticism has been hurtful. She began the post by thanking those supporting the search effort, but quickly moved on to a message for those criticizing the family. I don't think some people realize how bad it hurts to read these posts and comments about us. For those criticizing our choices, I hope this is something that never happens to your family. We've been told since day one to stay out of the media and off social media. I didn't get why at first, but now I see how mean people's words can be and how easily our words can be twisted. She wrote this on a Facebook public group. The things you say is just like kicking someone when they're down. Trust me, we're doing everything we possibly can to bring Ryan home. My mom is broken right now because Ryan is her life. She shouldn't have to be in the media and on social media apps to prove that she needs him. She is barely getting by. So please, before you decide to post something, think about how you would feel if this happened to someone you loved. Please be kind. Thank you for all the prayers and don't give up on Ryan. He is strong and will come home, she wrote. So with the search refocusing, they're really concentrating on searching areas closer to Ryan's home. Uh, Chief Bob Lawson said officers are moving back to what he refers to as ground zero, referring to the search in the neighborhood around Ryan Larson's home. Around 50 officers conducted an extensive search of the area. Leads have been few and far between, he said. Now here we get that clarification. This is coming from information straight from him. He said three different cadaver dogs all hit again on Saturday at Walnut Creek Lake. We had a dog back again. We're not going to go back every day with a dog because if a cadaver hits or smells something there, it's always going to be there. So there's something in Walnut Creek. Lawson said of a reward, we'll probably need to go down that road, but he said they have not formalized anything yet. He said there is still nothing to suspect there is a criminal element to this investigation. When asked about the investigation turning to a recovery, Lawson said, Again, we're two weeks out now. If Ryan is out there, I don't know. It's been two weeks. He said they're not dialing back their search efforts yet. And keep in mind, we're already how long into this episode? And we're still talking about the first several weeks. Um, as a matter of fact, when this article came out, this is marking the third week. Uh, so you can see the efforts extensive, the amount of media, a ton of it. But from here forward, it just quickly tapers off because he's got no leads. The leads are running dry. What else are we going to find in terms of information? One pretty important clue. But we have a big milestone that happens before that. June 8th, La Vista says happy birthday to missing child Ryan Larson. Although he has yet to be found, the community is gathering together this evening to celebrate his birthday. The goal for celebrating Larson's birthday is to remind him that he is loved and wanted back home, said La Vista resident Ryan Wendekind. When he comes home, he's going to need a bunch of cards to open up and know how many people have been thinking about him, have been looking for him, love him, and really want to meet him. It's something that we thought needed to be done, he said. Uh, I just, I really appreciate Ryan, how he's standing up in this. 
uh, helping the family, but also just showing he's becoming a great example of what you want in a community. I would be very proud to have that man living next door. Outside of the Larson's apartment, a pole is decorated for Ryan near the last place he was spotted at La Vista Kino. Police cars are now decorated with a green ribbon for Ryan. As a matter of fact, if you look into this case a little bit on Facebook, you will see a, a green ribbon with a picture of Ryan frequently. Lawson said they're exploring every explanation for Larson's disappearance. We've expanded radius of looking into sex offenders that live in the area. Getting more surveillance video is challenging because police need to subpoena to even see it. So that's kind of the first little grinding point we've heard about when it comes to this investigation. What's going on with that? We had a roadblock come up with a couple of key places we need to see video from. A couple places, their corporate legal has stonewalled us a little bit with getting access to video. So we've had to go through a subpoena process with at least two locations where we need to see video. As much as the community has supported us and we've been able to look at a lot of video, there are a few places we need to see and that's taken us a different route. It's frustrating. We have a young man. He's here and then he's gone. To me, somebody knows something. Somebody knows what happened to Ryan. Somebody knows where he went. It's frustrating, but we have a lot of of behind the scenes things we're doing to bring this case to a resolution. Police have thoroughly interviewed about 50 people. Lawson said this case is unusual and said a case like this hasn't happened in the area before. He said this case has also shown him a need for a Sarpy County rescue and dive team. Quote, I think law enforcement and fire personnel need to come together with a countywide strategy for a dive team, he said. Something uh, kind of tickled in my brain around this a little bit. Uh, when he was talking about someone knows where he went and that's something that we talk about in missing persons cases frequently is there some element of grooming that could have gone on around this is he talking to someone online uh i i don't know and even in terms of his route he leaves school he goes to kfc eventually winds up back in his own apartment complex but at a time where he doesn't have a key for his house. He can't get in and no one's there. It makes me wonder if he left a bag somewhere. Uh, you know, if he really is doing this research into how to evade police and stuff, like did he learn about what a, what a, what a go bag is? Did he stash a bunch of stuff, hide it in a bush somewhere outside of his apartment and then have to go back later to get it and then carry on from there? Uh, and if he is operating at that level in terms of planning, is that all his planning or is it possible that someone could be pulling strings behind the scenes on this as well? It's just another possibility that I think we need to stay open to uh, when you have a case like this. And it's pretty clear the chief is being clear. He's starting to lean towards someone else is involved here. He's being very direct here. He thinks someone knows where Ryan went out there. And for some reason, that information isn't coming back to them. So why is that happening? Here at Siouxland Proud, police are searching for a woman who may have information regarding the disappearance of a missing 12-year-old Nebraska boy. According to the La Vista Police Department, detectives that are searching for Ryan Larson want to speak with the person holding a phone in multiple images. And here we've got the pictures. So obviously a woman holding a photo. This photo is obviously one of Ryan and is a known photo. It's one that I'm seeing as part of posters and stuff like that. Um, but then there's this set of photos and they believe that this is actually that woman, someone in their twenties to thirties. Um, they just can't quite make her out. Police said she's not a suspect in this case, but may have information. Why is this person important to them? Lawson said the person holding the phone was seen asking questions about Larson and had an image of him on her phone. The picture was taken May 18th. So it's kind of interesting because I'm wondering, was she going door to door asking about him? And it looks like, did the person open the door and then snap a photo of her? Or was the intent to get a photo of Ryan so that they could look at it later if they happened to see someone that might have looked like him? Um, pretty interesting, but it does seem like she might've been part of a search effort. They said it might've just been a family friend or someone trying to help, but that's what they need to find out. 
They do find out, they locate her fairly quickly, and it turns out that she works for Larson's school district. So she is someone that is effectively just trying to help with the search. We get another person that comes up as a potential witness, and this is from, I don't believe it's the same camera, but it is from the same location where the footage of Ryan was found. Uh, we see the back of what looks like a man wearing a yellow beanie, walking his dog. Detectives want to speak with the person seen in this photo. They're not a suspect, but maybe a potential witness. Within 20 minutes of them putting that message out, the man was identified and they were able to talk to him. Uh, they say the image was taken from surveillance video outside of La Vista Kino, and it's between the time period of 12.30 and 1.30, so certainly in the sweet spot for him potentially seeing Ryan Maybe he has some information in terms of what direction he walked off from there. We know we've got the sighting back at the apartments after this, so I would assume he would just see Ryan, if he did see him head off in a direction, go that way. But who knows what other additional details. Maybe at that point we would know uh, if he had a bag on him or something like that. That's something else I saw kicking around. Um, there was some discussion about a backpack, and I saw the police chief be very clear that they're not aware of him having a backpack. Some of the earlier coverage I saw in this case was talking about he might have had a backpack. They're not sure if it just had school supplies or not. But like that could be an important question if this guy did happen to see Ryan and all of a sudden they note, uh, you know, yeah, I saw him and he had a duffel bag or he had a backpack or he had some different item with him. Maybe that could be helpful to the investigation in terms of them kind of tracking him down. Um, I haven't seen anything really come out from that. They've identified the man. They've obviously spoken to him, but I haven't seen new information. We do have a very important new clue that is uncovered. Uh, and this is in July at this point. Well, it's not uncovered in July, but the details that we get publicly kind of come through in July. A resident of the Larson's apartment complex found an umbrella that belonged to the boy near a dumpster. This led investigators to speculate that Larson may have been hiding in the dumpster. So the polka dotted umbrella that we talked about really early on in this video, part of the description, it looks like they do find that. Why is this information coming out this late? We're, we're going to get to that. It's basically because they were running DNA tests on it to make sure that it was Ryan. I'm sure they were also looking for other profiles. We don't have information on that, but they do confirm that an umbrella with Larson's DNA was discovered by a resident at the apartment complex where his family lives. The umbrella was turned into police within a few days of the boy disappearing, but law enforcement only recently received the DNA test results. The umbrella was given to Larson by his sister, who had just moved out of the family home. It had special meaning to him. It was found on the grounds of the apartment complex, and the discovery confirms that Ryan Larson, or at least his umbrella, made it back to the apartment complex. He didn't have a key to the apartment, and no one was home at the time. So couple that up with this sighting of someone that lives in the complex that says they saw Ryan. We've got some fairly strong indicators that he did get back to the complex. But once again, from there, what? And that's why I'm just wondering about this situation. Did he leave something behind that he didn't want to take to school? Because maybe it would have tipped them off if he's carrying around a big bag or something, went back to the apartment complex to pick it up and then left from there. That's just kind of where my brain gets stuck with this. But with those considerations, uh, you know, we've looked into cases before where we're afraid that someone did get into a trash bin, might have wound up at a landfill. Uh, here we get some more details on how they kind of closed out that aspect of the investigation. Police Chief Bob Lawson said investigators quickly knew the dumpster in the apartment complex where Ryan Larson was last seen could play a key role in ruling out certain theories in the boy's disappearance. Within the first week, they had GPS tracking on the trash that was in the apartment complex dumpster. We knew there was a dumpster in the complex, and you're looking at all different avenues because we really have no evidence whether he was abducted, whether he walked away, whether there was foul play involved here, Lawson said. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children brought in experts on July 5th for a three-day assessment to look at the cost and safety hazards of such a search to search the entire cell of a landfill roughly would take 78 months with 20 people a day working five days a week, said Lawson. 
Lawson said they focused on the trash that was dumped after an eyewitness last reported seeing Ryan in the apartment complex that afternoon. The trash from Southfield apartment complex goes to a transfer station, which mixes the trash and then is taken separately to Mills County, Iowa and Douglas County's Pheasant Point landfill. Lawson said video from the transfer station shows the truck emptying the dumpster from its complex. We have video from the truck with trash being dumped and no object coming out, a body-like object not coming out, he said. Lawson said they also had someone who's a similar size as Ryan get into the dumpster and see if they could open the lids and get back out. I've seen some footage of the dumpsters. They have those kind of flimsy plastic lids. They're not big, heavy metal lids. So it seems like uh, he probably could have gotten out if he did go into the dumpster. But the big thing, they compared the timeline. They have that witness that says he saw him somewhere around 140 to 150. Um, there's also video of Ryan. So they know that the video is from 130. The trash pickup happens at 1230. So effectively, the trash pickup happens when Ryan is leaving school. We've got that one sighting of him. Admittedly, we're not 100% sure on the video. They're pretty strong on it. We know they're off testing it. We still don't have a definitive result, but they're pretty. They're thinking it's him. We've got a eyewitness, which of course eyewitness testimony isn't 100%, um, but we do know that his umbrella is found there. So does it completely close off the possibility of a terrible accident happening with him getting into the dumpster and that being processed, that being picked up. I don't think it closes it off a hundred percent. I think it closes it off a good 90, 95%. Uh, the thing I'm worried about is if he did leave school, went straight back home and the video turns out to not be him, the witness, maybe they got the time wrong. Maybe they're wrong about it being him as well. The hard evidence that we have is the umbrella that being found next to the dumpster is really concerning to me. And that's why I would just leave that possibility a little open, but obviously a search effort of that magnitude. Um, you know, look at the Corey McKeague case. We're years later and still debating uh, if, if Corey's in the landfill or not. But to his point, you don't search landfills on a hunch. You search landfills on evidence. Uh, another quote from Lawson, we have examined just about every possibility we can. At this point, the best we have is a video image from La Vista Kino that doesn't really prove whether it's Ryan or not, but the characteristics in the video show a figure that according to the mother and daughter and what we believe is Ryan. We need a tip. We need something. Ryan didn't have an electronic device on him, so we don't know. You can't trace where he's at or where he's been. So... Uh, we've also got no cell phone coming into play in this case. I don't believe he just walked away and went on a Tom Sawyer hunt. Something happened to him and we need to find out who and what. A team of six detectives from La Vista's police department are still working to find Ryan. You want to hope for the best, but you have to be prepared for the worst, Lawson said. And I think preparation is something everyone needs to have going. Seems to me like he's very worried that this is certainly a recovery effort, but I'm also getting a very strong vein through these conversations. He thinks there's someone else involved in this in some way. So we do also have a comment from his sister, Taylor from Ryan's sister, Taylor. Uh, and this is just from a few days ago. Hi everyone. I know a lot of people are searching for an update on Ryan. So I just wanted to put something out for the public. Many of you have probably heard that Ryan's umbrella was found. The police are not disclosing where it was found specifically in the apartment complex. Um, I don't know. The articles I hit are pretty clear about it being found close to the dumpster. I don't know if maybe she means maybe there's more than one dumpster area in the complex. Uh, there have also been many comments on a reward. I want you all to know that we're trying our best to get everything figured out with that. It isn't as simple as throwing a GoFundMe up and asking for money. A separate bank account must be set up. A phone line must be set up. There needs to be people on standby 24 seven to take calls. I don't know. I'm going to actually look into it when I'm done recording here. Is there a crime stoppers in this area? Cause they shouldn't be needing to worry about, uh, those types of logistics. They should just get the GoFundMe running, uh, 
talk to Crime Stoppers, have Crime Stoppers use their phone number, which should already be manned 24-7, uh, and then line up the reward so that it actually goes directly in with Crime Stoppers. Uh, or Crime Stoppers has access to it in some way. She's probably right about the bank account on, and all that aspect. But having to set up your own tip line and have it manned and stuff, I don't know that that needs to happen. And she's also pointing out here, it must remain anonymous. Basically, a bunch of the conditions she's asking for is Crime Stoppers. So I don't know if they just don't have one active in that area, possibly. Uh, we have to have contracts drawn up for when a reward is given, etc. There are so many things that have to be taken care of to do that. And we're also trying to go through the right channels. Um, yeah, I'm going to look into that. And if I do find out there's a Crime Stoppers in the area, I'll reach out to Taylor and, and tell her about that. Uh, the police still have leads that they're investigating, but they also have no obligation to let the public know everything. We don't even know everything because it's an investigation. We're trusting that the police will do their job and God will protect Ryan. We appreciate everyone who has supported us and prayed for Ryan. The generous things that you do will never be forgotten. We don't want anyone to forget Ryan. So please keep spreading the word. If you have flyers, keep putting them out wherever you go. When that big storm came in recently, we noticed it knocked down a ton of posters. Me and my mom ended up replacing and putting up about 50 flyers last week. There are still ways to help and get Ryan's name out there. So please don't give up. And at this point, I want to ask you, if you have friends, family, acquaintances in Nebraska, please share this video with them. Let's help them virtually with this effort as well get more exposure raised to ryan's case trust in god because he can move mountains and this job isn't too small for him we believe that ryan is still out there and will come home be positive and be kind on behalf of myself and my amazing supporters through paypal patreon buying merchandise uh, I've decided to make a donation to projectlifesaver.org in Ryan's honor. Once again, Project Lifesaver is the premier search and rescue program operated internationally by public safety agencies and is strategically designed for at-risk individuals who are prone to the life-threatening behavior of wandering. The primary mission of Project Lifesaver is to provide timely response to save lives and reduce potential injury for adults and children. That's another important consideration. This isn't just for kids. Um, it was actually started by, I believe it was a sheriff whose mother had recently gotten Alzheimer's and he kind of came up with this idea for this charity. They are also a 501c3. Um, they want to reduce potential injury for adults and children with the propensity to wander due to a cognitive condition. So a big thank you to my supporters for helping me make a donation to this cause in Ryan's name as well. This is where I turn it over to you, Brain Scratchers. There is a really big need in this case to remain respectful. Um, I know there's some people that are just going to question, why isn't the family talking? Why isn't the mother talking? I'm telling you, there are many, many different reasons for that. And something I always try to remember, uh, because I'm dealing with people in these situations pretty frequently, you're not going to see the best side of those people necessarily. They're in pain. They are terrified in some cases. They're hurting. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, we, we need to support this family the best way that we can support them. And in some cases, that is literally by giving them space. And I think that's what's needed in this case. Uh, it's pretty clear to me, Taylor is stepping up to be a bit of the family communication on this. Um, and I'm thankful for that because when I talk to families in these situations, I talk to them at different phases. Now, right now we're at two and a half months out on this case. A year from now, that family's position can change very dramatically if they feel like the investigation has gone nowhere. They have details that have never been released publicly that they think might be important for the public to know so that those details can be um, kind of in the public mindset, might lead to other tips being called in, things of that nature. Family's position in terms of law enforcement with missing persons cases can be its own ride, its own journey, and get to very different places. So I'm thankful Taylor's there kind of stepping up. Um, I, but I, I don't think she's going to need to do that. I feel pretty confident in the police chief. Um, but this is obviously a tough case. We ultimately don't know what's at play here. It, did it start as some type of adventure 
in Ryan's from Ryan's perspective, and then something else has happened to him, that's something I'm really concerned about. Um, there's there's a lot of different possibilities around this. So let's please please be respectful as we're talking about this in the comments down below. But above that, if you really want to help this case, please share this video with friends in Nebraska. We need to keep the awareness raised on this. Keep people talking, keep people looking for Ryan. And if you're one of those people in that area, remember, he's probably not going to want to be approached directly. Um, so follow those steps of calling 911, keep him in sight, get the police there, let them handle any type of interaction. Of course, two and a half months out, we're concerned about some other types of outcomes. And it could be that there's someone out there sitting with the information and they just haven't found it in their heart to call it in yet. I'm hoping that you're watching this video too. And if you're that person, please pick up that phone. This family deserves answers. It's a terrible spot for them to be stuck in this place of not knowing what happened. Before I end today's video, I want to thank several new patrons. Thank you, Shauna Blackwood. Thank you, Tracy Seamer. And thank you, Tammy Raider Erickson. Also, a special thank you to Shelly Marie for increasing her pledge. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com, where you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or just buy us a coffee, like Jamie Hollanden recently did. I appreciate your support. Stay safe. Take care. We'll see you back here on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked on the Lord and Arch channel.